that means you need to multiply this side by sine of x and this whole thing by 1 minus cosine of x, which means you have to FOIL that out, right? That's not the difference of two squares. So again, just like I was talking about yesterday, part of this is doing the algebra correctly. Common denominator, sine of x times sine of x is sine squared x. When you FOIL this out, you get minus, sorry, not minus, you get plus 1. And then 1 times negative cosine is negative cosine. Negative cosine times 1 is negative cosine. So if there's two of those, I'm going to go ahead and say that's minus 2 cosine of x. So I'm just doing the foiling in my head. And then negative cosine times negative cosine is positive cosine squared. What we found in uh, second hour today is a lot of people didn't FOIL. Like a lot of people just said 1 minus cosine x times 1 minus cosine x was 1 minus cosine squared. That's not true, right? You have to FOIL that out. There's a middle term here. On the bottom, just like the one in our notes from yesterday, I'm not going to multiply that out because I know nothing's going to cancel, and I can't break up addition, but I can break up multiplication. So I'm going to leave it as multiplication. And again, just like the one we saw in our notes yesterday, if I have a sine squared plus a cosine squared on the top. Can I put those together and make that equal 1? So I can say that equals 1, and I'll show my work on this. But so I can say that that becomes 1 plus 1 minus 2 cosine of x. And if you already add that to 2, that's OK. I was just showing my work here. Two minus two cosine of x over one minus cosine of x times sine of x. Then what could you do? What could you take out of the top of that? A two. So if I factor a two out of that, do I get one minus cosine of x over one minus cosine of x times sine of x? And remember, the goal is to simplify, which means with fractions, usually that means being able to cancel something out. So your goal is to try to get to a point that you can cross stuff out. And so how do you know where to go with this? Well, you just try to put things together as much as you can, and then you get to a point that you say, oh, if I factor a 2 out of this, look what happens. I have a 1 minus cosine of x that I can cancel out of the top and the bottom there, which means I get 2 over sine of x. Looks like a good answer, but we're not going to leave it like that because we can bring that up and make it the sine on the bottom is the same as cosecant on the top. Any others? Any others?
idea is that we've spent the last couple of days trying to get better at simplifying, but so today we're going one more step further and we're going to solve equations today. But you've got to be able to factor, you've got to be able to simplify, you've got to be able to do that part of it in order to be able to solve the equation. So I hope that you've been at least uh, looking at the homework. Hopefully, doing your homework. So uh, we have some time left in the second hour, so hopefully, maybe we can get through our notes today and then I can help you if you have another question on the problems. Yesterday, we simplified our trig expressions again. Today, we're going to go that one step further, and we're going to solve equations. That means we're going to need our unit circle stuff on top of all this algebra stuff. Um, I think that's why people hate this class so much, because um, you got to know, learn the unit circle, you got to learn new stuff, but you also have to know all your algebra at the same time. Um, that's maybe why people hate math, but I think it's awesome. Because in other subjects, you know, like you learn one chapter on stuff, and then you can just be like, whatever, I don't like that chapter. I don't want to learn this chapter, and I'll just skip the next chapter. But math, it all is related, and you have to go back and recall all that information. But if you learn one chapter on Germany and the next chapter on Japan, you just can forget all about Germany, right? You can't forget all about math. It all stuck together. Maybe why I like it, but maybe why you think it. So tomorrow we're having a worksheet which means we're going to kind of review what we've been doing this week, get an extra day to work on it, but uh, we should also have something else tomorrow, right? Okay. All right, so let's start with this first. I think this is the, the easy part of the homework, but today in second hour, they kind of freaked out when we did this, so maybe it's not the easy part, but we'll see. Um, I wrote the directions that are in the homework because, again, sometimes the hardest part that people struggle with is what the directions are asking. You don't necessarily have to write all the directions word for word. I would never write the word trigonometric in my notes because you could just write trig, right? Like you're trying to shorten things up. Use trig substitution. I would write use trig substitution if I was writing my notes. Um, to write the algebraic expression as a trig expression <coughs> of theta, which means get rid of x and simplify it. That's all it's really saying. And they just give you a substitution. One, if they give me this and they tell me that x equals 2 cosine theta, I can just plug 2 cosine theta in for x. And remember, you cannot break up addition subtraction under square root as much as you want to. As much as you want to say that this is just 8 minus 4x, you cannot do that. It's not true mathematically. You can only break up multiplication or division in a square root. You cannot break up addition subtraction, which means kind of the same thing that we've been doing with the other stuff of can you simplify this enough so that we can break it up and simplify it. Um, if I distribute this, do you agree that it's not just cosine squared, it's 2 squared cosine squared? This becomes 54 minus 16 times 4 cosine squared. We're going to distribute that square there. And if you can do that all in one step here, you don't have to show this in between steps. Because really, 16 times 4 is just 54. So I get the square root of 64 minus 64 cosine squared theta. And again, the big idea here is you cannot break up addition subtraction. So could we do something here, turn this into multiplication instead of addition, just addition and subtraction? Yeah. Could I factor out 64? If I factor out 64, I'm left with 1. One minus cosine squared, uh, something with my Pythagorean identity. So sine squared, which I'm going to go up here just so I'm not writing lower and lower. I think that's the same as saying 60, 
four times sine squared theta. Notice we have no more addition subtraction, yes? What is the square root of 64? What do you think the square root of sine squared is? And every time on these types of problems that they give you with the square root, it's always going to work out that you can factor out to the number in front. It's going to be a perfect square. What's left over is probably going to have the Pythagorean identity. And then you can always just take the square root of it. Um, it's just some algebra practice. Yes? No, because you can't break up addition subtraction. See what I'm saying? Like you're saying, what if I just wrote that as 8 minus 4x? That's what you're saying? And the reason why, you're right, you, it seems like you're going to get the same answer, right? But you're not, because if you do that, and then you plug in 2 cosine theta, that's not going to equal 8 sine of theta. You see what I'm saying? Because now this isn't squared anymore. You see what I'm saying? Because now you would get 8 minus 8 cosine theta, not squared, which means you can't do that. And the reason that you can't do it is not because it doesn't work here. It's because it just doesn't work. If I took the square root of um, 2 plus, oh, I the square root of 4 plus 4 is really the square root of 8, right? You can't say, oh, that's just 2 plus 2 because the square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of 4 is 2. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's why you can't break up addition subtraction under a radical is because that does not equal the square root of 8. If that makes any sense or not. But that's why you can't do it. People really want to do it because those are perfect square numbers. But it's just not mathematically correct to do it. So that's why you have to get it to a point that has multiplication. Because you can say the square root of 4 times 4 does just equal uh, 2 times 2. Okay, so that's why we have to get to multiplication. Okay? So let's, you try one of these. Just like this, just change the numbers around. You try this, you can do it on your paper, or you can do it on the whiteboard, whatever you want to do. And uh, you can do it on your paper, and then you can show me your answer on the whiteboard if you want to have it in your notes. But see if you can do this. While you're working on this, don't forget that Friday, Pi Day, uh, and you can bring in your own food for extra credit, and you can uh, dress up, like wear a shirt or something. But you can also just make a piece of and if you um, do something creative with it, don't just write pi on it. Just write one. Just write pi on it. Pick a piece of fruit. Treat it like pizza. That's what we're going to Friday. Crazy thing. Two days later. And by this hour, I'll just be in six times that day, and I'll be sitting in front of the desk. I'll be in the turn out to be something with a Pythagorean identity that you can replace that with one trig function. So like on this one, I can pull the 100 out and I'm left with tangent squared theta plus 1. And again, that's the part that you should be trying to say, do I know what that is? <coughs> is that a negative in front of that? Because I think we have a Pythagorean identity that says tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. So 
within the square root. I believe this the exact theorem that we wrote out is tangent squared, or 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Right. So that's where you uh, need to know those Pythagorean identities. We're going to have a quiz next week at some point. I don't really know what day yet. Uh, like a real quiz without notes. Um, that you're going to have to know those Pythagorean identities. So I hope that you're at least aware which ones go together. Uh, if not, you're going to have some studying to do before next week. So there's a few problems on your homework like this. The rest of your homework, and it actually is like reverse order because this is the end of your homework. But the rest of your homework is solving equations, which is the part that I've been kind of talking about this whole week. So these are kind of like my steps. I put gold here, but maybe you should say steps. Um, when you're solving a trig equation, just like when you're solving an equation for x, you got to get x by itself. So like my goal is this, is I want to get the trig function by itself. Once you get the trig function by itself, you got to solve for the angle. And then I'm going to show you what I mean by this in just a second, but they're going to give you an interval to tell you what answers to give your answers between. And this means if I'm actually solving for an angle, then I've got to go back and use my unit circle, or I've got to use my reference triangle, and I feel like most of us uh, are using the unit circle at this point. But this is the day where this algebra and trig stuff come together with the stuff we did last chapter, and that you've got to know where does sine equal one half, where does tangent equal a 33. Right, you got to know that kind of stuff. So to isolate the trig function, that's the part that's what we've been working on the last two days. Factoring or simplifying or using a Pythagorean identity to help us get it simpler. Uh, that's the part that we've been doing. And then the rest of it's going back to kind of chapter four stuff. Um, but that's the, the big step that we've been practicing. But the difference is the last two days, everything we've been doing does not have equal signs in it. And today they have equal signs, so which is why we go a step further. when it says find the solutions over the given interval and then they're going to give you an equation and then they're going to give you an interval and this is almost always the interval that they give you because it's the whole unit circle they're saying starting at zero including zero go all the way around to two pi but don't include two pi because zero and two pi are the same thing uh, so that's almost always the interval it could be different which basically just means we're going around the entire circle but before we can worry about this part we got to be able to solve this. And just like I was saying yesterday, my go-to thing on this is if you don't know how to do this, if you look at this and you have no clue what the first step is, change it to x's or change it to u's if you want to do u substitution. But anytime you see a trig function, change it to an x or change it to a y or change it to a u and then ask yourself, do I know how to do that problem? And if I do, I'm going to do the same thing with trig functions. And so like on this one, I always say, well, what if we just change this to x's? Like if this said 2x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0. Do you know how to solve that problem? It's a quadratic, right? Which means factoring. It means if you really wanted to, you could complete the square or do the quadratic formula. Um, these should always be factorable for us. So by all means, you can just solve it like this. Or if you want to do the u substitution where we could say, instead of saying x here, we could say u equals cosine of x, and we could say 2u squared plus u minus 1. But this works on other ones that don't have u substitution. 
Uh, if you just change them to X's, or even if there's two trig functions, change them to X's and Y's, and then think about what you would do, um, usually it helps you get over the, the scary part of the trig. The kind of sneaky part about this one is that there's the number in front, right? Which means if you're going to factor this, you have to do the whole multiply the first and the last together. Where you multiply those together and you say, what multiplies to give me two, then adds to give me a positive one in the middle. So is that going to be positive two u minus one u? Oh, yeah, totally leaving it as cosine. Yes. I tend to do it like that. But it seems like you guys love you. So uh, I'm poking on for each other for sure. Uh, but yes, when I do this, I always just write it as like uh, 2 cosine x minus 1 cosine x, and then I don't have to plug back in. But yeah, u substitution is totally just a method that helps you solve it, but you don't have to use u if you don't want to. <laughs> down the outside. And then remember we're changing this to factor by grouping. Um, so I just factor out a 2u and I would get u plus 1, which means over here I need to factor out a negative 1 to get u plus 1. Again, why do we teach factoring in Algebra 1? Well, because it kind of trickles into all this math sometimes. And so then I can change this. I'm going to change it back to cosine as I do this. So instead of saying u plus 1, I'm going to change that to cosine of x plus 1. And 2u minus 1 is going to go together, or 2 cosine of x minus 1 equals 0. We did this, I think it was day 1, uh, so Monday of this week. We factored stuff like this using u substitution and our trig function. The new part is, is the equal sign. So just like when you factor quadratics, what do you do now? Now that it equals zero, what are you going to do? Like if I have x plus 2 times x minus 1 equals zero, what do I do to find my solutions? Yeah, the zero product property says if you have two things multiplied together to give you zero, don't you set each one equal to zero and get your solutions? It's the same thing. There's just trig functions in there. Which means I'm going to say either cosine x plus 1 equals 0 or 2 cosine x minus 1 equals 0. And this is just still the algebra part. We're not to the actual solving the trig stuff yet because I'm just trying to get the trig functions by themselves. So factor if you can. Use your trig identities if you can. Get to a point that now, now it's just algebra. If you get cosine by itself, am I just going to subtract that over and say cosine x equals negative 1? And over here, if I want to solve that for cosine, I'm going to add 1 and divide by 2, and I get cosine x equals 1 half. These should ring a bell of like, hey, where does cosine x equal negative 1? I think I should know that from my unit circle. Where does cosine x equal 1 half? Oh, maybe I should know that from my unit circle because they have to be from your unit circle if you're not supposed to use calculator. How do you know what answer to give me? It has to be between 0 and 2 pi. So let's think. Where between 0 and 2 pi does cosine equal negative 1? Cosine is x, right? So where does x equal negative 1? here at pi, it's the x coordinates. Cosine is 0 at pi halves and 3 pi halves. The other one is where does cosine equal 1 half? And so I know it's, I know it's either going to be pi 6 or pi thirds, and now it's just making sure you know which one. Cosine is x. And I think it's 1 half square root of 3 over 2, which means the x um, is 1 half at pi thirds. Is that the only place between 0 and 2 pi that cosine equals 1 half? No, because I'm going all the way around the circle, right? What other quadrant is cosine positive in? 4? 
And this is where I don't even need to draw my unit circle. Because I know if this is one half, then I know the one down here, the same reference angle, is going to be one half also. So if this is pi thirds, what is this going to be? Or it's 2 pi minus pi thirds because I'm taking away the same reference angle. If you need to draw your whole unit circle, you can. But the idea is if you know where 1 is, you just find the other quadrant where it's positive or negative. Which means there are three answers to this problem. There's pi and pi thirds and 5 pi thirds. Look how much math we just did in one problem. We had the factor using factor by grouping. We did u substitution. We... Um, Solved trig functions. We use the unit circle, right? Like there's a whole lot of math going on in there, which means uh, it's kind of getting to the point. What is it? March. We've had a long year of uh, that. We're really like putting a lot of math together. So um, the trickiest part, I think, is getting to this point, like just learning the algebra again using trig functions. So I try to pick a few different ones today just to give you some ideas here. So let's look at another. There's, I think there's just two more so that you maybe can have a couple minutes to start your homework. Again, these are the same directions. That's why it has a little interval after it, 0 to 2 pi. And maybe every now and again you're going to use those trick identities. But instead of looking at this and thinking about what is, does that equal anything, Think about it in terms of algebra. So again, my advice is if you look at this and you don't know where to start, change that cotangent to an x. So instead of cotangent squared, what if I wrote 3x squared minus 1 equals 0? Do you know how you would get that x by itself? Can't really factor on this one because it's not perfect squares. It's not a trinomial. What would you want to do on this if you're trying to get x by itself? At some point, we'd have to do a square root because we have x squared. But you can't do a square root unless you get the x by itself. Like, you have to get x squared isolated. So what could you do to get x squared by itself? Add 1, divide by 3. Yes? Same idea over here. If you only have one trig function in this problem, whether it's squared or to the fourth power or anything, all you got to do is move the other stuff over and then take that root. Uh, or if it's only cotangent, all you have to do is move the stuff over. Again, how do you know if you're going the right direction? You should get something that you don't need a calculator to do on unless the directions say you calculate it. So if I was doing this, I'm going to add 1 and divide by 3. And then, just like over here, someone said we should take the square root of this. I just want cotangent, not cotangent squared. So I'm going to do the algebra, and I'm going to take the square root of both sides of that equation. And first of all, what do we have to remember to do when we take the square root of both sides of the equation? Plus or minus. And I'm going to write this, the square root of 1 is 1 over the square root of 3. If this were my answer, I would rationalize that. I would say that's the same as saying plus or minus square root of 3 over 3. But I'm trying to use my unit circle. So I'm going to leave it like this because it helps me when I look at my unit circle to think about which one it is. Um, so that's not my answer. It's just kind of an in-between step. Once you get the trig function by itself, completely solved for, you should now be doing your unit circle. Um, before we start looking at our unit circle, if I want where it's plus and minus and I'm going all the way around the unit circle, how many answers do you think I'm going to get? I want to know where it's positive 1 over the square root of 3 and where it's negative 1 over the square root of 3. How many quadrants is cotangent positive in? How many quadrants is cotangent negative in? Means I should have four answers to this problem because I want where it's positive and where it's negative, which means I need both positives and both negatives. Cotangent is, uh, what's the ratio for cotangent? Is Jason over opposite or in terms of x's and y's? x over y. And I know I've said this before, but in second hour today, people were talking about how much they hate cotangent because there's all these fractions. 
All you have to do is look at the x coordinate over the y coordinate, and you can forget about the fraction, right? So if you, hopefully you know it's either pi thirds or pi six. So it's one half square root of three over two, and down here is square root of three over two one half. When you put a fraction over a fraction and you flip it up, those twos are always going to cancel. So when I do cotangent, Philip has taught me this this year, and honestly, it's, I've always drawn triangles for tangent and cotangent because I hated to deal with the fraction. But Philip pointed out that the twos are always going to cancel, and it's changed my life. It's made me like the unit circle a lot more. Because now I know if I just look at the, the numerator of the x coordinate over the numerator of the y coordinate, that will be cotangent. So looking at this, if I take this x over this y, does that have a cotangent of 1 over the square root of 3? Does pi 6 have a cotangent of 1 over the square root of 3? No, because it's square root of 3 over 1. So you don't actually have to compute anything if you just know the ratio, which means, just like the last problem, an answer here is pi thirds. And now if you want to make the entire unit circle and figure out where else is that true, you can. But the idea is you should know your reference angles at this point. If this is true, and we know we want the plus and the minus, sign doesn't matter. If pi thirds is true, do you agree all the other thirds are also going to be true? Because this one and this one are positive, this one and this one are negative. That's where we should be with our unit circle. If you have no clue what I'm talking about at this point, it's kind of worrisome. Because we should be able to say we know all of these have the same coordinates. All that changes are the signs. And since I want both positive and negative, I can say that 2 pi thirds is also an answer. And what would this be? 4 pi thirds. And this would be 5 pi thirds. Because 2 of those are positive and 2 of those are negative. That's only true when you do plus or minus. If you take the square root of your equation, probably you should have four answers. Okay? That's what it had in. I think this is my last one, and then we'll talk about homework. Notice I changed the directions on you, and we'll talk about the, the, the normally stuff, and then we'll go back and look at this. It's just square root of three. The cosecant's not under the square root. Notice the directions say find all solutions. That means they're not saying that you're just going from 0 to 2 pi. They're saying they want every solution. Um, we'll deal with that at the end, but keep that in mind right now. Before you deal with that part, though, we got to solve this. And again, think about what if this cosecant wasn't here? What if they just said the square root of 3x minus 2? How would you get x by itself? Add 2. Divide square root of 3, right? We're just trying to isolate the trig function. So if I add 2 over, I get the square root of 3 cosecant x equals 2, or cosecant x equals 2 over the square root of 3. I don't like cosecant and secant so well with my unit circle. I mean, I could do them, but I do much better with x's and y's because I can use my unit circle. Which means if cosecant x equals 2 over the square root of 3, what else do I know? Sine of x is the square root of 3 over 2. So you don't have to do that, but to me, my, my brain just works better that way. And it seems to be a theme running in our notes answers today because uh, I want to know where does sine equal the square root of 3 over 2? Pi thirds, I think, right? Because it's y. So it seems like every answer, don't, not every answer in your homework is going to be pi thirds, but for some reason, the three examples that I chose today, we got pi thirds. So that's right here, pi thirds is one half square root of three over two. Is there anywhere else just around the circle, forgetting about the word all for a minute, what other angle is going to have a sine at square root of three over two? Sine is y. So that has to be over here, quadrant 1 to quadrant 2. And so I did make that 2 pi thirds. I'm not going to do 4 pi thirds and 5 pi thirds like we did on the last one because we're not including negatives, right? This one does not say plus or minus, so that's why I'm only giving the positives. Now that would be the answer if the directions say from 0 to 2 pi, where are the answers? But it doesn't. It says 
find all solutions. Which means, what else is true? If pi thirds is true, what else could you do to get another answer? You could add 2 pi. And then could you add 2 pi to that again? And then could you add 2 pi again? And could you just keep adding 2 pi for the rest of your life and never actually list all the answers? Right? You with me on that? Because if I add 2 pi, I'm going to get back there. And I add 2 pi again and 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 again. So in second hour, someone said, can we just put etc.? No, that's not very mathematically correct. Can we just put dot, dot, dot? No, that's not very mathematically correct. We want to make an equation. And so if we're going to say we're just going to keep adding 2 pi, the way that we show that mathematically is we say the answer is pi thirds plus 2 pi n, because n is an integer. So any multiple of 2 pi plus pi thirds would give me a, a correct solution. So the big idea for this is when you see the word all, don't just give me pi thirds, just plus 2 pi n. Could I do the same thing to 2 pi thirds? If I'm at 2 pi thirds, I can't really see it anymore. But if I'm at 2 pi thirds and I just keep adding 2 pi, I'll always get a true answer. So when you see the word all in there, you just add 2 pi n to all your answers. Exciting stuff today, huh? Some good thinking stuff today. Uh, we have some. We have like ten minutes, so I want you to. Uh, do you know? I want you to write this down, and then I want you to write down fifty-one, so that I can talk about common mistakes that you, uh, not you, but people can make. And I'll tell you again, the homework's backwards. Starting. 70, 72, those are like our first examples, and then up to that are solving equations. Don't forget that Friday is when your test prep ends and retest, last day of retest. Also, Friday's high day, so it's going to be a little out of control down here all day. So if you uh, retake a test on Friday, you're probably going to get sent to ISS to take it so that you won't have a scan of the same day. So not that you can't just open up Friday and just have to retake it. But all of the math games are going to be out of control. So they still do high day. They just keep it the same day. I feel like I can. Usually he'll be like, if you want to go watch, you're going to go watch. I think this is 51. Here's what I want to, uh, here are my pieces of advice. Step one is get it equal to zero if it's not equal to zero. Because usually you're going to try to factor or something for the most part. Now that's not going to always be true. Like sometimes you might want to move numbers over. Number two. Do not divide by a trig function. Because it seems like a good idea at the time sometimes, but it's a bad idea because if you divide, like in this problem, some people say, what if I just divide by cosine, and then cosine's gone, and then I can just solve what's left, and hooray, that's so much better. It's true, you get an answer if you do that. You get part of the answer, but if you divide by cosine here, you're losing some answers. Like, you're only going to get half the problem right. And so, don't do that. What do you think would be a better choice in this problem? Instead of dividing by cosine, what could you do? Factor is a good idea. The zero product property is our friend in these problems, because if you can make it multiplication equal zero, then you can separate it, right? So you can factor out a cosine, And then once you have it factored, just like the first example that we did, only we um, like we did FOIL, can I now just set cosine equal to zero, set this equal to zero, and solve those two separate problems? So factoring is a good idea. Make them equal to zero. If you feel like you want to divide, probably that means you need to subtract and, and factor it out. Um, and we'll do some of these tomorrow. Definitely check your odd answers in the back. Make sure you pay attention that up through 54, the directions say... Uh, 0 to 2 pi without a calculator. Um, and then they say find all the solutions.
calculations. And then 63 and 66, they say use a calculator, which means it's not from your unit circle. And if we need to go through more of those tomorrow, we probably will. Um, but those are the only two you should be using a calculator on. The rest of these you should be doing like from your unit circle, from your brain. Okay? So work on this. You still have about five or six minutes to get this one solved. Maybe get the next one started.